A, a smartwatch will catch a health condition in somebody they didn't know about. They were an active person, thought they were healthy, and then it shows them, no, there's really more going on here. This happened to Amani Miles, who is 12 years old and lives in New York City. He's at home, just chilling with his mom, and his watch started to buzz and wouldn't stop, and they thought, well, let's schedule an appointment. They found out he actually had a tumor. It was cancerous, and they were able to operate on him uh, before it was too late. It, it seems to be a trend right now to focus more on our, our physical health, even our, our mental health. Currently, the average American spends $13,000 a year on our health, which with insurance and all that, you can believe. The fitness industry in this country is a $30 billion industry. Globally, it's going to be $400 billion by 2028. Some of you work in that. Some of us participate in that. Athletes like LeBron James and many others spend over a million dollars on their bodies every year because Nike does not want to sponsor an injured player, right? I mean, this trend, it's a good thing. We only get one body in this life, right? And our minds, there's healthy ways to cope with things and manage with the stress. But is that all we are, brains and bodies? Is that the whole story? You know better than that. You know that that cannot tell us, cannot give meaning to our lives. There's something deeper, right? We're spiritual beings. We need to focus on who God made us and saved us to be. And that's what we're talking about today, our spiritual health. How do we focus on that? It's not something we can track uh, with a watch. How, How do we put that as more important as chief priority in our life. I want to share with you the story of of young Timothy and how the gift of faith was passed on to him as we saw in baptism this morning, how that gift developed in him, how it became this inheritance that he could share with others. It couldn't be spent away and fought over, but it was something that just grew and grew and spread through his life. And the people that were involved with that, the connections that brought that about and made that happen. We're going to read from uh, his mentor's letter. Paul is writing young Timothy. The missionary is writing his student as he's in prison at the end of his life to keep passing on this faith and encourage Timothy and us in our spiritual health. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The first reality I want us to face today about our spiritual health is that we are always being formed spiritually. Our children are always being shaped spiritually whether we know it's happening or not. And it all depends on the sources we're drawing from, what content we're consuming, what people we're around the most, the people we look to to guide us, the people we trust for guidance. Those radio personalities, podcasters, and YouTubers that we latch on to, those friends we spend the most time with, are forming us spiritually. They are either building us up in our faith or they are attacking our spiritual health. There's nothing neutral about it. And so who are the sources you're drawing from? Here's how it worked for Timothy It started out with his grandma, Lois. 
and his mom, Eunice, they were Jewish believers in God. And this was actually a complicated situation. They were a divided house because Timothy's dad, a Greek, did not believe. And so you can only imagine the, the strife about what ideas, what beliefs do we pass on to little Timothy. But mom and grandma won out. They sat him on their laps, uh, even before he was a toddler, from infancy. They read him little verses. They sang little songs with him about God. They passed on the faith. They did not buy into the popular idea of today, well, let the child stumble on the truth and let them decide what they're going to believe. No, they, they knew just like you don't withhold formula or milk from an infant, like you don't let a toddler learn how to cross the street by themselves. If God's word is true, if it's healthy for you, you teach them from little, little on. They, they can always turn from it later. The world's going to make sure they, to turn them from it. The devil's going to fight with all his might, but you can teach him from little on. And that foundation they established in little Timothy, it lived on until missionary Paul came about. See, Timothy lived in what's modern-day Turkey now, and Paul was on his missionary journeys, and he met Timothy. And he showed Timothy, hey, everything mom and grandma taught you, it's true. The Savior actually came, he died for our sins, And he rose again. And he taught him everything he had learned from Jesus to build on that foundation and keep his faith going. Then Paul took him in as his apprentice, like a Jedi would do. And he spent tons of time with him. And he took him on his journeys. And Timothy became a world traveler. And Paul gives him tons of responsibility, even as an inexperienced young guy. Even though sometimes Timothy gets sick, His body's weak, we find out. He's kind of timid and shy at times and not so confident. Paul takes him in because he knows faith in Jesus is enough. It's a gift that can be fanned into flame. And Paul does all this. He passes on this faith even to the point where he's in prison for the last time. When he writes this letter, he's about to be executed by the emperor Nero for spreading the gospel. And it's this letter that we come to. And so this shows us that spiritual health can be there and be be healthy and even growing and strong in those whose lives are falling apart. Paul is about to lose everything on this side of eternity. But he presses on and he passes on the faith. He points Timothy to the one who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He says, Timothy, don't you realize it? You see chains, you see suffering, you see my coming uh, death. But that's not all. You and I, we're already in the realm of eternity. And the people we're sharing the gospel with already live in the realm of eternity. And death is just making that permanent. Some mentors, some parents might see all the trouble that goes along with being a Christian or or a leader in the church and say, I don't want my child to go through that. It's not worth it. I want them to have a little bit of fun and pleasure in this life and not have to deal with all that trouble. But Paul doesn't hold back. It's worth it to him. He passes on an inheritance and so do mom and grandma. They pass on an inheritance. They pass on a reason for Timothy to care at all in this uncaring, cruel world. A reason to care about other people as precious souls, just as precious to God as he is. A reason to care about God's word as the thing that really gives meaning to our lives and lifts us up and sustains us when other things fail us. So Paul presses on and he says, Timothy, fan this gift into flame. Any of you who have faith in Christ, any faith at all, can fan this gift into flame. It can develop, it can grow in you. You can become even more spiritually healthy. You may not feel that way. Like Timothy, you may feel timid, not confident. Weak in your faith, that's normal. When we look within, that's what we're going to see. But when you look at Christ, 
That's how the gift gets fanned into flame. It, it might just be an ember right now glowing in the dark. It might be a little spark, but God put that there and he can work with that. Here's how to fan that gift into flame. Paul says, the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. What is this gift of power that all of you have who have any faith in Christ at all? This gift of power is the gospel, the dynamite of God that smashes apart unbelief and doubt and your greatest fears inside of you. This gift of power goes to the deepest parts of you and it smashes apart any shame you're living with, any guilt you're still carrying around, that in the sight of God you can be unashamed, free from guilt, a freed person to live for him, to serve him. The dynamite of God. Any of you who have faith in Christ can tap into this power even when you're weak, even when you're sick, even when you're not feeling so strong. You look at the Son of God, you draw from him. And then you're strong even when you're weak. What is this love of God? that any of you who have faith in Christ have that can be fanned into flame? God has so perfectly loved you. In a world where we fear rejection and not belonging and we see the comments people make on our feeds and we're crushed by criticism and we're not invited to that party and our coworkers are gossiping about us, you're so perfectly loved in Christ. This is the solid ground you stand on. This love is unconditional. It's not because of anything you've done or you've proven yourself to God. God's given it to you in Christ. God, Christ was rejected by God for our sins so we could be accepted. When you tap into that love, that becomes your security. That becomes your stability in life, even when other people don't like you. That love of God is a gift in you that can be fanned into flame. How can you daily tap into that love? Remind yourself of how perfectly loved you are in Christ. What little habit, what little reminder can you make each day when you wake up, the first thought that goes across your mind? The, the content you consume, what you're thinking about listening to on the way to work, what you're looking at on your, on your work break that can remind you of that love of God that will not change in a world that's always changing. And finally, this gift of self-discipline. What is this gift that any of you who have faith in Christ have and can fan more into flame? This is not willpower. This is not you being the person that wakes up at five and hits the gym and does all the right things throughout the day. This is something different from that. It's not a power you get from yourself. God wants to sink his word so deeply into you. He wants to increase your trust in him that at times you actually make the wise choice. At times you actually refrain from evil. At times you actually hold your tongue instead of blowing up in anger. At times you're actually kind and patient and hospitable to people in your life that don't treat you that way. If that's happening at all, that is evidence that God's power is living in you. That's not from you, that's from God. That can be fanned into flame. So how do, we, how do we keep working on our spiritual health? We live in a world that says, do this meal plan, do this workout plan, one more program, do, 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 one more thing on your schedule. This is one area of your life where God says, it's been done. Just sit back. Just receive the gift each day. Be reminded of my love for you. Be reminded of my power that lives inside of you, even when you're weak and sick. Remember my great love for you in Christ. Just receive it. Just listen to it. I have two believing sets of grandparents. I saw this happen just like the Loises and Eunices 
and Paul's and Timothy's. Who are your Lois's and Eunice's? Who are your Paul's? Remember them. Thank God for them. Think of what they've done for you. Who are your Timothy's? You can pass on this faith to. One set of grandparents gave me the cross that I wear up here when I preach. My other grandpa, I saw him as an 80-year-old man uh, working with our church's children's ministries. I saw him holding the hands of children as they sang songs to Jesus, did little crafts. For 20-some years of my life, I saw him treat his neighbors decently, even the ones that were annoying. He was kind to them. I saw him treat family members fairly. I saw him in the same pew every Sunday and then coming up to the, to the Lord's Supper and then sitting at his kitchen table and he's emphasizing what really matters in life. He passed on an inheritance I can't spend away that our family can't fight over. That's the inheritance all of you have been given the gift of faith that you get to pass on to. And then, as he went into eternity... There we are at his bedside, yes, with tears, yes, holding on, but singing, Jesus sinners does receive. Amen.